Three, two, one. This is the Chargers Unleashed Podcast. Here are your hosts, Dan Wolfenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, is being brought to you by UFC Fit and Temecula, Charger Bolt Family, Golden Road Brewery, Tick Pick, and Bet Online. Dan Wolkenstein, I am stoked for today's mm-hmm. show as we are continuing our NFL draft positional breakdown. This time, talking about the offensive tackles, the big boys, the hog mollies, as the Chargers draft priorities have definitely shifted since free agency has ended. So there are a lot of guys that we're going to get in to talk about uh, in this show. I'm excited about it real quick before we kick off and uh, take care of a few house cleaning items. Dan Wolkenstein, how are you, sir? I am doing great, Jake. Thank you. Yes, we're going to talk about all things offensive line, specifically offensive tackle, uh, with a couple other mentions of a couple other guys, which we'll get into. Um, also, I believe, Jake, we have some discussion points around the Daniel Popper mailbag that came out recently. Uh, All that we can get relating to. around the offensive tackle position. So it's going to be it's going to be a very interesting day. This is one that you wish that you probably could have done live because I'm sure that they would have a lot of feedback. And especially mm. with the list that Dan and I are going to be talking about, um, it's probably not going to be the same. And <laughs> the way that we have divvied up the offensive tackles between <laughs> true offensive tackles that we believe that are going to be tackles at the next level, as opposed to the guys that are tackles now coming out of college, but are better projected as guards. We'll get into all that. But first, before we start off, want to make sure that we let you guys know about bet online, bet online is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info and odds. Find all the latest developments, including this week's odds uh, for Major League Baseball season. And we are just in the thick of that. Bet Online is your continued source for all sporting and wagering needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino and poker games. It's super easy to get started. So join today. Make sure you use the promo code BELIEVE when you go on and sign up. Learn why everyone is saying Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on popular sports and games. Bet Online, where the game starts. Now, Dan Wolkenstein, as I was saying just before, I so vehemently went through that ad read. Thank you very much. I could tell you were about to crush it. That. Crushed um, it. I was. I was. <laughs> it doesn't happen that often, which is why, <laughs> which is why Dan was going to give me the kudos. I appreciate it. Um, but we want to preface this before we get into this because obviously we've got a lot of talk to talk about with these prospects. There are obviously players that I'm higher on than Dan is players that Dan is higher on than I am as it relates to uh, our top 10 list. But this is the beauty of this list. This is why these things are fun. Everybody's got their top 10 list and all of them are for the most part going to be different, but we want to mention this because there's going to be some guys that you're not going to hear on this list, but for a specific reason. So I want to mention those now and we'll talk about them a little bit later after we get through with the top 10, but players like Darian Kennard, Sean Ryan, other players that are projected to be more of the guards in the NFL. We will get to those when we eventually end up talking about the interior offensive lineman when we do our positional breakdowns for that. So if you're in the middle of the show and you're not hearing any of these guys' names and you're saying these guys don't know what the hell it is they're talking about, that's... They're probably right. They're probably right. Yeah, they're probably (laughs) right. But there was... (laughs) There was a good reason. So we will get around to talking about them, I promise. Uh, Dan, before we get into OT1 and the start of our top 10 list here, um, anything that you'd like to preface as far as your the time you spent to make this list, that you have any difficulties? Uh, um, good question. No, um, this list was, I don't know why, but this list was especially hard for me to do. And... I think the reason why is because, like, so I don't know about you, but when I went to do my list, Jake, I started from, like, the, I'm not going to say the worst because that's unkind, but I started from the lower tier prospects and worked my way up to the best ones. And I think because of that, like, it was tough (laughs) starting off my film sessions of all these because, like, there are some guys that I just would not pick. Um, But by the time I got to the cream of the crop, which we're going to get into today, uh man like there are some nasty offensive tackles that we're gonna be getting into and uh, i think it is healthy to set the stage real quick again 
Chargers picking at 17. They could go offensive tackle at 17, given their current scenario, where currently they don't have an offensive tackle on the right side that we feel comfortable with, other than a Matt Filer, who has had experience playing at right tackle, so he could do that. But other than him... There is a yawning chasm at right tackle as it stands right now, essentially. (laughs) Yes, if it's not him... I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, so offensive tackle is certainly in play at 17. Also could be in play at 79, although the chances of you hitting on one then is a little bit harder. But still, uh, that's why we're discussing offensive tackle today. And I'm excited to get into it. Jake, OT1, pipe dream that's going to last a whole five <laughs> minutes until we realize we're never going to touch this guy. Please start, Dan, because I want to hear yours. All right, offensive tackle one for me. Um, and I don't know if this is a hot take, but Ikan Okwanu, for me. That's not a hot take. Is offensive tackle one. He came out of NC State. Even though 50% of the people probably turned off Chargers Unleashed right now after you said Ikan Okwanu, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why are they turning us off? Are we getting canceled? All the Evan Neal people just went berserk. And- oh, yes. Okay, <laughs> now... I like Evan. There's nothing against Evan Neal. I'll let Jake take the lead on Evan Neal. But Ikimu Kwanu is just an absolute beast. The dude is like a snowplow of a run blocker. I think he is really savvy with the way that he kind of uses defensive line aggression, almost to their detriment and to his advantage. He kind of uses their leverage against them. Always seems like he's looking for a dude to hit. Defenders are always on the ground. He has that like nasty, nasty feel that you want to get from your offensive tackle. Um, excellent seal, I think, with his hands. Very really smooth, quick feet. Quite a good athlete, too. Powerful, strong hands. Punches like crazy. And is just an absolute anchor. Like I, I think he, in my opinion, I think he's offensive tackle one, like, handily and we're I, th- I think we're i think we're a little bit um oh i can't think of the word but being as though rashawn slater is on our team like we've gotten to see excellence at the tackle position in terms of like fundamentals and skill set and not that Iquano doesn't have that but what he brings is like the intensity and like the just wreck wreak havoc on everyone so to have like the calm cool collective Rashawn slater and aquano back side to side like come on man now is it gonna happen not a chance but we gotta talk about it yeah you have to talk about it if you wanted to make an offensive lineman cocktail you know you mix in your fruit your protein a scoop of athleticism two scoops of technical prowess and then mix in like a leader of violence <laughs> that's Iki Aquaru, essentially. The athleticism from this guy is just ridiculous. It was on a display at the combine. It's 6'4, 310, ran a 4'9, 340, combined with a 29 inch vert and a nine foot broad jump. Like you said, Dan, he's just a powerhouse in the run game. Had 18 big time blocks in the run game this season. That's per PFF. Um, 34 inch arms, uses those to his advantage really, really well. Good hand placement with the leverage. He just dominates when it comes to the run game. And he dominates as if he just wrote the book on how to do it. Essentially, you know, he can, he could step in day one into any run blocking scheme and thrive pass protection for him is not the worst. And he'll be able to fix the little things at the next level. But if you wanted an offensive tackle to be that road grading, wearing a defensive down violence bringer, he's that guy. Yeah. And and again, the, the thing that we have to our luxury is we already have our all pro left tackle. So in context, like we don't need that guy. Right tackle needs a little bit less of uh, leverage on them at all times. Uh, and if you can get someone who is damn good, like you're set. You don't, and again, I, I want to, I kind of want to brace this. We're, we're going to go to Evan Neal next. Jake, I'll let you take the lead on him. But When we needed a left tackle, like, you have to hit on that. 
right tackle we've seen even last year. I know there are a couple games that cost us. For the most part, you can kind of get away with a makeshift right tackle as long as they're like average. Until you until you go up against the elite guys, you'll get exposed. So as we go down this list, like we're gonna quickly get through the top probably two or three, and that we're never gonna be able to touch. Although maybe there were three, depending on who we're talking about. Um so don't get discouraged. Just because we're not gonna get that top guy like we did last year doesn't mean you're not gonna get a stud right tackle. No, I didn't and real quick, just because of what you said, it's like the there's there's two sides to that coin there when you talk about can you win with a serviceable right tackle? And this the short answer is yes. But Dan, I feel like we've been looking for a serviceable, consistent right tackle since the days of Jeremy Clary. It'd be nice to actually oh, get, get out. a good one for a chance. Uh, but let's jump into Evan Neal, uh, Dan and I's consensus OT2 here. Neal's athleticism and movement skills just defy the laws of physics. Someone his size should not be able to do what he does. Um, He's got plenty of videos of doing his his box jump switch leg thing where he just catches himself in midair. I mean, it's ridiculous athleticism for a dude of his size. Um, you know, he's just a physical freak. And, and, and all of this is despite not doing any testing at the NFL Combine and very little drills at Alabama's Pro Day. He's the embodiment of the phrase, go watch the tape. And the tape that you're going to find on him is very, very good. And, and that's what he's told NFL teams, but he's, he's played. Uh, we haven't even mentioned the versatility. We talked about his freak athletic stat, uh, stature, but he played all, he played four out of the five spots during his college career at, at along the offensive line. Um, and that's the type of results that you want to see from a three-year starter against SEC competition. Played it very, very well. Has only allowed 24 pressures over the past two seasons. Uh, uses his length as advantage um, on top of his hand placement. He's a technician when it comes to his run blocking and plays with really, really good fundamentals. He doesn't have that consistent power that you'd like to see in all of his reps. And that's why he's a little bit of OT2 for me as opposed to the way that Aki Aquamu plays. But... Um, and he doesn't necessarily play with a nasty streak either, but he's got those athletic and fundamental traits that should translate well at the next level. And of course that coaches and uh, coaches and GMs are going to salivate over. Yeah. Uh, you took a lot of the points that I had. Uh, so I don't want to repeat a lot of them. I, the one thing about him, like he's a great offensive tackle prospect um, playing the sec. So went against the premier offensive line or went up against the premier defenses all throughout college and did very well. Um, there are some question marks though. Like there are some question marks around like what his play weight will be moving forward. Like if that's a concern, cause like he lost 15 pounds and also it was much faster. But like, I think there are some people that are wondering like, is that going to be sustainable? Um, he has some elite tape, but then like, there's also sometimes you're kind of like, he kind of takes off a player too. Um, I almost had him as my offensive tackle three, but I have him as offensive tackle two, just because I think the tape says itself sets says enough. Um, but Evan, I like Evan Neal, but in my opinion, in terms of like a sh in terms of pure offensive tackle, I, I think he's a very well rounded player, but I don't think he has the elite skill sets that I'm looking for as much as. Iquanu, or honestly, maybe the next guy. Like I, I gave, I gave Evan Neal number two because I think overall, well-rounded, overall, full body of work. Like you're not gonna miss. Like he's gonna be a very good pro. But I don't know if his ceiling at, is as high as some of these other guys are gonna talk about. Dan, take us into the much revered offensive tackle three. Okay, now I might get some blowback for this. Although, no, never mind. I'm getting blowback for the next pick, I promise you. Uh, number three for me, I've got Charles Cross. Mississippi State, is that who you got as well? That is his. Okay, so Jake, you and I are three for three so far. I feel like this is where we split after this. Um, yeah. <laughs> six, five, three, ten. Enjoy it. <laughs> six, five, three, ten. I think some of his best traits are his use of leverage. He's got super quick feet. 
he's really fast at getting out on the perimeter, which I think about like the Chargers scheme specifically and think about those like long play action bootleg plays that you see Justin Herbert rolling out. Like Charles Cross, I feel like would be great to have because you see him slide out to the right much quicker, which is what you need than any of these other guys. Um, but with that, he still plays under control. I think his lateral quickness, like I mentioned, was probably the best of this class, in my opinion. Um, really smart, cerebral player. Does really good against some of those counter moves. Um, he seems to actually really enjoy run blocking as well. Uh, you see him clear lanes with ease. Uh, he's got like grappling hooks for hands sometimes where like as soon as he latches on, Jake, it's just like that. It's over. Um, I love his technique. I think he has arguably some of the best like high football acumen and IQ. Uh, like I mentioned earlier with Evan Neal in some of my kind of quorums about it. I think Charles Cross as a pass protector purely is better than Evan Neal. Is he better at well-rounded? I don't know. But for what the Chargers need, I think he's a better pass protector. But again, our run game needs some help too. So it's kind of like, they're kind of like two way to be for me. It just depends on what you're looking for. But if your overall thing is like protect Justin Herbert or die, then it might be Charles Cross at two. This is going to be a bittersweet discussion as it relates to Charles Cross for me, because I'm about to talk about all the things that I love about Charles Cross and the fact that he probably won't even be there at 17 is the bittersweet part. Dan, there are some people that have Charles Cross as their offensive tackle one. You and I talking about this, obviously we have Icky at our number one spot in terms of the chargers for their big boards, for the points that you just said, as far as the pass blocking aspects. And if, if all things are to, keep Justin Herbert upright. Charles Cross may be the Chargers uh, offensive tackle one, the best suited for what it is that they want to do. Now, he's not the most athletic. He's not the most experienced. But as a two-year starter, Cross put together some of the most consistent tape as it relates to pass blocking in 2021. Only surrendered 16 pressures on 719 pass blocking attempts. Again, this is by PFF. Uh, this was actually a really cool little nugget that I found, Dan. Normally, when you go on to Lance Zerline's draft profiles that he has for his guys, and you know, normally it's a one-to-one -one ratio for his player comparisons that he gives to everybody. So he gave Charles Cross two. Two. He gave a physical player standpoint from measurables and then a player comparison. So physical standpoint from the measurables, he compared him to Taylor Moton of the Carolina Panthers. Same, very similar measures there for his playing comparison, Dan. He compared him to Tristan Wirfs. And if you remember way back when, how high we were on Tristan Wirfs back in the day, wouldn't <laughs> mind to get some aspects of Tristan Wirf's game playing for the Chargers, no doubt about yes, it. Please. Back to Charles Cross. He has strong hands, 34 and a half inch arms to the point where most times it just looks effortless for him when he's doing some of these pass blocks. Uh, he's dominated against good SEC competition. His body control, his hand placement, his recoverability, even when it initially looks like he's being beat, is very impressive when he's able to bring everything back and, and, and re-anchor himself. Um, he doesn't have the quickest footwork, but if he is drafted by the Chargers to be their right tackle, he's going to showcase his pass-blocking talents from the very first snap in this offense. And if you got him to bookend Rayshon Slater and protect Justin Herbert for the next decade, this is just an out-of-this-world home run. We had, who, what was it? We had Austin on and he said that Charles Cross would be the undoubted home run selection for the Chargers if he was to be yep. there. Now, the unfortunate part about it is I just don't see him falling to 17 and Dan this up. <laughs> How we always like to laud Vegas whenever they come up with their their game lines and what it is that they know from their inside information, but they came out with over-unders this afternoon for certain players. Charles Cross 
Dan, take a take a wild guess on the over under mm. line that they put for Charles Cross. Oh, when he gets picked? When he gets picked, yes. Uh, over or under one pick? I'm going to say 12 and a half. Seven and a half. Whoa, jeez. They put the over under at seven and a half for him to get selected. So Honestly, again, I'm pounding the, I, I would hit the over on that. But it tells you how I mean, good he is. I mean, it's it's weird because we hear these things from Austin last week that he doesn't believe that the league is as high as some other people are on him. So does that cause him to drop? I don't know. This is this is going to be something that's going to be perplexing for those first 17 picks because I feel like Cross has been a player that ever since free agency has passed. And obviously we've gone through all the pro days and combines and testing. And when you just look at overall draft value, as far as the best prospect that could still be available there at 17, he may be the guy. So I just can't say for certain that he's going to be there. I hope he is. I would be thrilled with this pick. Um, You know, start crossing your fingers and saying your prayers now, people, (laughs) because we're going to need them. All right, Jake, I think this is where you and I are going to diverge. Um, yeah. Did you enjoy that? That was good. That was, some, that it, was, was little, it was fun. Like, we were very like, harmonious. I'm not used small to Small time of similarity. Yeah, that was nice. Yes. <laughs> and then here we go, shutting it down right now with my number four pick, Trevor Penning. Out of Northern Iowa, I have his number four. And I'm ready. Bring out the pitchforks. I'll take the smoke. I'm fine with it. Jake, I'm assuming you do not have him at four. Is that right? I have to preface who it is that I talk about at number four before I even get into it. But I don't want to take any of your smoke. So all the smoke is going. Oh, on thank, thank right you. Now. Thank you for letting so, me have all the smoke. I appreciate it. By all means, um, go for it. Okay. So Trevor Penning, 6'7", 325, ran a 4.89, 40, I believe, 28-inch vert. The dude squats over 620 pounds. Um, Similar to Aquanu, he, this guy is an absolute beast. You've all heard kind of like his notoriousness for, you know, playing past the whistle, which I think some people are using against him as like almost a detriment or a risk with him. Um, but he is a bulldozer. He's an absolute animal, incredible finish, plays to slash through the whistle. Uh, good length, good arms, super athletic, obviously. And... I mean, look, you, you watch the tape and like you're always seeing defensive ends just getting tossed to the ground, like left and right. Uh, even when he gets to second level, he'll blow up linebackers like it's nobody's business. Um, great run blocker, really good use of leverage. Uh, in my eyes, I see him as as a smart player that does pretty darn well with like multi assignments and stuts and things like that. I'm taking Penning to the moon. Um you you always know where he is on the field, which is kind of fun. Like literally, if you just like took the all twenty two tape, and you, you can always find out where he is because the guy who he's playing against is either on the ground or you see him slanting down the line. Uh, the one question mark I have for him is: Can he be harnessed? Actually, there there are two. One: Can his intensity be harnessed? Because he plays with like this like anger, right? And, and and I think depending on his coaching staff, like I think that can be reeled in. I really do. And I know like there's some question marks about like the penalties that he gets. There's some question marks about like can he can he play without that fire? I'm not saying he should play without the fire, but I think there's a fire to a point. Um, the only other kind of red flag that I have is coming from Northern Iowa, like. Going from Northern Iowa to playing in the SEC would be one jump. And then going from the SEC playing in the NFL would be another jump. So it's kind of like like he's got a big jump in who he's playing against going into the NFL. So like, do I see him being able to toss around guys like ragdolls in the NFL? Less less so for sure. But he his his mentor, Duke Manyweather, has been kind of helping him out. Like in the right system with the right scheme and with the right coaching staff and offensive line unit, like I think they got it. And imagine like the calm, cool collective Rashawn Slade on the left side. And then like bad boys, three Trevor Penning on the right. Like (laughs) something about that just gets me excited. 
And I know, I know, I put something out on Twitter today and people went after me. But I like Trevor Penning. I really do. It's because you did a simple thing just by putting Trevor Penning and then the smoke blows out the nose. <laughs> and without any context, Dan, you know how that could be taken on Twitter. So you have no one to blame for yourself because you called down the thunder on that one. Um, especially with how people in the charge fan base feel about Trevor Penning. Now, let me prep. Uh, Dan, first off, we get to be similar for one more pick. But <gasps> two, let me just preface this. I literally, up until even a few hours ago, was flip-flopping, depending on the next player they were eventually going to be talking about. Uh, it was very difficult for me when I was going through and looking through a lot of things. And let me also preface this. Neither one of either Penning or the next player that I'm going to be talking about is someone that I would select at 17. It's not. Agreed. I think Thank that, I think that Penning at that. 17 is extremely too rich. Would not do it if that is their target. Uh, I would hope that they would either trade back, go to a higher position. I might even go one of the higher guards at 17 rather than on some people's boards as the fourth offensive tackle on the board. You never know who else is going to be there. But as far as players that are going to be solid for you to me, Dan, if you traded back from 17, you picked up an extra second round pick. There's part of me still that would even say draft whatever play you want with who you traded back with. Say you go back to 23, 24, somewhere around there, select whatever is the best player there and then go get another one of these tackles that we're going to talk about here in a minute. If you were able to acquire a second round pick, that would be my first choice. But if we're okay. just talking about well, real quick, overall real quick. tackle prospects, go ahead. Real quick, I, so I Trevor Penning at 17, I wouldn't hate the pick. Like, I would understand the pick. I think it'd be a little bit of a reach. But, like, I could get excited about Trevor Penning at 17. Like, if he gets he, Chargers at 17, pick Trevor Penning. Like, he'd be like, wow, they kind of reached a little bit. But, like, I, I would like it. Like, I think his floor is pretty good, but he does have a lot to improve upon. But I think he can. And, like, if he does, like, kid's going to be a freak. I'd be much happier with Trevor Penning. Again, not completely shutting it down, but I'd be much happier with Trevor Penning at 24 than oh, I would I mean, with yes. even a thought about taking him at 17. But I just do. so we can get into my thoughts about Trevor Penning, offensive tackle four, um, or we should probably use the three words that he describes himself as physical, nasty prick. Um, <laughs> became a starter in 2019, 6'7", 330, as you said it, Dan. He imposed his size along with his physical style of play, um, which we saw plenty of at the Senior Bowl. I think that that's really what started getting his notoriety is when you start seeing him pancake people and, and almost to the point where it was dangerous to where he's throwing defenders at the legs of some of the quarterbacks they're playing. So... Yeah, he does play. I mean, obviously, he just he looks pissed off and all the time. And I I mean, there is a part of me that thinks how enticing it could be if you put him up against Max Crosby and just two angry, pissed off guys battling it out between another. I could tell you right now, I think still Max Crosby would probably get the better end of that. Um, but even still, just, you know, looking at all these things. And as Dan said, the biggest questions that surround him. Um, is he's still not polished enough that you'd want to see from a technical standpoint of an offensive lineman. And these penalties, these penalties, Dan, over his college career, he's had 30 plus penalties, 16 through 12 alone this past season. And five of those 16 were personal foul calls. And that's not, a, I mean, that's again, that just, it, just out of those 16, five personal foul calls, his positioning, his hand placement, they're going to need, like I said, they're going to need to improve dramatically when he meets NFL level competition. And as you said, can those things be corrected? Yes, but I think it's it's not so much of, if these were all false start penalties that we were talking about here, Dan, I don't think that he would be knocked this much. I think for the standpoint is, can it's it's not just so much from a coach to come in and teach him strict fundamentals with his hands and his timing it's now hey guy can you keep your emotions in check which is not the easiest thing that coaches can control and i think really that's going to be 
the biggest thing that at uh, the biggest hurdle that he has to get over because he, he just wants to go out and punch someone in the mouth. Nothing against that, that old school mentality of an offensive lineman, but more times than not, it's gotten him in trouble. And if he does that in the NFL, it could be costly. Yeah, I, I've got him at, so just to confirm, I, I have, be clear, I have him as like late-ish round one grade for me, like 20 and beyond. So, like 17, like I said, I think he'd be a little bit rich. He'd be a back half of the first round pick for me. But I'd take him. Okay, Jake, do we diverge at five? Who is your five? OT tackle five for me. Central Michigan zone, Bernard Raymond. Oh, we are now taking a different path. It's now <laughs> gone different. Okay. Yep. So I really went back and forth with this. And Bernard Raymond is just such an interesting prospect. And I will say this before I get into what I think about him. I don't see him as a first round prospect. I know I'll, he's gotten a oh, lot yeah. of hype over the last couple of weeks. Um, and there's been quite, quite a lot of bit of talk about him being a first round pick. And I don't much like, much like Trevor Penning, not someone in the, that I would definitely select at 17. And I probably wouldn't be selecting him even if I traded back a few picks, but he's got such an interesting background, Dan for an exchange student from Austria was a wrestler, started playing football as a tight end when he came to the U.S., um, and then converged over to to the offensive ta- to as, as an offensive tackle. And as far as a guy from, as, with his size, he's got a lot of plus athleticism for a, for a guy, uh, you know, with his measurables. 30-inch vertical, just under 10 foot in the broad, put up 30 reps of 225, Again, coming from this wrestler background, he's got a lot of power behind him, knows how to move people properly. Uh, on top of that, he's got good foot, uh, I was about to say foot quickness, but foot quickness to move against as edge rushers, uh, finishes his blocks, can get to the second level, and only allowed, Dan, 10 pressures on the quarterback in 2021. But given all that, there are still some raw qualities about him that he's going to have to perfect at the next level. Normally, again, with someone that you're going to be spending this high caliber of a pick on, you'd like to see them coming in with a little bit more starting experience. And again, just because he hasn't played this game that long, still has the physical intangibles that you want. And he's going to need some refining, especially with his hands, uh, with his hand work. And, and one of the biggest things that people don't like about it, and this is where the age police start coming out a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. similar to Trevor Penning, is that Dan, he, he, he's 24 years old. 24 years old, that's very old for a player coming in. But um, (laughs) take that what you will. Some people hold that in higher standards than others. And he's going to have to improve his technical and recognition skills and just going to need next level because he's going to. Yeah. um, So interesting. So I have, so I, I mean, I'm not that far off from you. I have. I have Rayman as number six for me. Um, but I'll give a couple of points that you did not talk about. Um, I love his leverage. I think he hands off stunts really well. I think he's a pretty smart offensive lineman. Uh, a couple of things that I don't know if I, I, I might disagree with you on. Um, I did not think that he had the quickest feet. And I think you see that uh, when quick you... Quick feet s- for a guy his size. Okay, have yeah, quick sh- feet. Sure. But compared to the guys ahead of him, at least, well, where the most guy ahead of him, uh, he he can get beat by speed off the edge. I think because of his lack of quick footwork, um, and in terms of like frame, like he's a bit on the I don't want to say thin because he's not thin, but like for an offensive tackle, like he's on the fitter side. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not the greatest run blocking tackle. Um, and I could, I think he could use a little bit more, a little bit more technique. Again, I'm kind of nitpicking here, but overall, I like him. Um, I do not have a round one grade. I've got like a mid day two grade for him, uh, which I don't know if that's a hot take, but uh, I like the traits, but like, I don't know if I would be okay with him being my pick 
in the first round. Dan, let's hear offensive tackle five for Team Wolkenstein. Okay, offensive tackle number five. Are you about uh, to piss me off right now? I'm, I might. I might. Mm-hmm. I might. Um, I know how much you love your co-host. Uh, so I'm going to pick a guy that has the same name as me. Daniel Falele out of Minnesota. The mountain. I call him Mount Everest. 6'8", 380. Literally is more than double what I weigh. <laughs> Everyone comps about like Makai Becton. Like he has like the Russell Okun kind of vibes. Like the guy is huge. And if you watch him, nobody, not a single player can overpower him. Not one. Uh, I think he gets wide very quickly. For his size, again, asterisk, for his size, pretty darn athletic. Has kind of like that bulldozing mentality where, like, can you imagine, like, Austin Eckler running behind someone that big on, like, a, a screenplay? Like, that would just be sick. That'd be unfair. Um, I like him in the Chargers passing game specifically. I think it's a nice kind of change of pace for what the Chargers have in Slater versus him. And, like, is he is he the most light-footed? No. Like, is he the fastest? No. Does he have the best technique? No, but in terms of like sheer raw power and someone that is going to protect your quarterback more so than you already had. And again, in this time frame, we're looking at kind of projects slash projected possible starters, but I don't necessarily know if I would be super excited about him being my starting right tackle. If I could have him be the guy that's either backing up Filer for a year, or hell, I mean, if he is the starting right tackle, like I, I think he'd be better than the guys we already have if it's not Matt Filer. So I really like him. And honestly, like I know I am kind of, I'm doing the thing you're not supposed to do where you're just like looking at measurables and you're looking at Trace. And you're like, damn it, I want that guy. And like, I know I'm being sucked into that. But he is so freaking huge. Like, I'm just, th- I'm just thinking like the literal, like, regardless of who it is uh, as a defensive end, like it would take longer to get around a guy that freaking huge than it would for someone else. So I think he'll be able to use his kind of raw traits to kind of uh, gloss over some of maybe his weaknesses. Definitely has room to improve in a lot of ways, but man, Watching him is just like, I would love it. I would love it. Again, just a preface and just before people get crazy, I have him as a day two pick for me. Solid day two pick. Maybe like mid mid to end second round, early third round is kind of where I have him. So let me continue your preface there, Dan, because I think that this is something that does need to be addressed before I just, I mean, and again, I thought I had at least 20 more minutes before I was going to be this irritated on the show, but no, you know, you decided to, you decided to accelerate that dramatically. So congratulations. Here it comes. Um, As Dan was saying, his grade that he has on Daniel Falele, what was, would you say a mid second round pick for him? Like a mid, like a late mid set, mid late second round at the least, like early third. So Daniel Falele is one of these prospects that I've seen, projections range all over the place. Some people have him as a first round talent. Some, most people have him as uh, a second round pick, uh, you know, others, he doesn't get out of day two. Other people based off of some of the traits that I have, don't have him that high for me. Is he on my top 10 list? Yes. Spoiler alert. He ended up as my OT 10. Oh, and there, 10. And there were, and there was a point where I didn't even have him on my list. Oh, and I'll tell you jake, why, Dan. Jake, 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 jake. I will tell you why right now. Dan, if we were looking at the aspects of what we saw from Storm Norton last year, and if we're going all the way back, it's like as far as what the problems have been at the, the right tackle position for a long time with the Chargers, and especially now when you look at how competitive the AFC West is going to be. 
you know, the Raiders outside of Max Crosby and the damage that he did in his own, they went out and they got Chandler Jones. You had Randy Gregory come over to the Denver Broncos to bookend with Bradley Chubb. Kansas City's already proven that they can beat us more ways than one along the defensive front. So you want to have someone that's going to be able to have that lateral quickness that's going to be able to battle off NFL level pass rushers. Dan, I don't disagree with you on any aspect when you're talking about what sticks out to you about Daniel Falele. The dude's not a person. He's a fucking planet. 6'8, 390 at the pro day, Dan. He actually weighed 384 at the combine. So he put on six more pounds. Let's also not forget this was a guy that came to Minnesota that was weighing over 400 pounds. So you've got to give credit to his offensive line coach, Brian Callahan there in Minnesota to get him in playing shape, which was nice. But if we're to talk about one more positive thing, Dan, Hey, I'll give it to you. He only gave up one sack. And in the final eight games, only uh, one quarterback pressure last season. Not bad. Not bad. Now here's where I have the problem with him. Now, maybe this is just my preference for what I look for in offensive linemen as opposed to yours. Not that either one is better than the other, but I just like my guys to have that aspect of good blend of an athlete. Uh, their athletic abilities and their technical prowess and their high football IQ. Not to say that, obviously, from a physical standpoint, Daniel Falele checks that box three times over. <laughs> There's no question about that. But the technical aspects and the rest of the physical me- me- measurements that you want, Dan, this is where a little bit of the red flag comes up for me. Dan, didn't test at the combine, but here was his pro day numbers. A seven, nine-inch broad jump. A five six forty, and his three cone was over eight seconds. Okay, Jay, arguably what, the what, what, hang on. on. What, wait, wait, wait. What what do you think your broad jump could be, bro? I for, <laughs> first off, my broad jump it isn't going to be anything. Okay, it's not going to be anything because I don't have the lower body strength. <laughs> but I like how you decided to take a cheap shot at me just to break me off of my. How about my your four? How about your forty? How about your forty? Man, dude, mine's gonna be a four seven. Maybe I could beat Rich Rich Eisen. Maybe that would be it, dude. I don't roar. I got a bum knee. Let's go, Jake Hefner. Okay. I got a bum knee and a week back, dude. I can't run the way I used to. Okay. I'm not putting any high expectations on myself. Uh but seven's good. Going back to it again. Seven nine <laughs> in the broad, five six forty. Dan, his three cone drill was over eight seconds. Now, if there's two measurables that you always look at it when it comes to offensive tackle, everybody wants to know what the uh, important drills are. Obviously, you're, you're not really looking at the overall 40, but you are looking at the 10 yard split. And then when you want to measure someone's quick lateral ability on how they're going to be able to handle edge rushers, that three cone drill becomes very prominent. And for his being over the eight second mark, that's not ideal. So here's here's my biggest issue is that Yes, the man's a planet, wins with power, but I think he relies too much on that. And Fair. there was even times at the Senior Bowl where people were able to figure him out, cut in on inside moves. You have any of these other guys that are coming in and staying low. Any edge rusher in the NFL that just comes up and they they stand up straight very early against him, I'll give it to you. Filele will get the advantage there. But any of these guys that stay low, that have a good bend to them, or they're going to come in with some good hand movement and get inside, he's going to find a, that he's going to have a tough time with that. So given that standpoint, because to me, he's just a little bit more of a developmental prospect at the next level. I definitely, as you said, not someone who I would want to see starting at my right tackle spot next year. But with the rest of the guys that we're going to talk about, I would much rather have them with a combination of their technical abilities and their physical attributes, even though you could see Daniel Falele from the Hubble telescope, essentially. Yes. And I will look, just saying a guy that is that huge, like he could go a little slower for lateral quickness. Cause like he's that big, like a big man moving, I think gives you a little bit of a break, but I take rest. All right. So Jake, you talked about, my number five was Falele. Your number five, I believe, was Raymond, right? Yes. All right. Number six. Who do you got? Number six is actually one of my favorite prospects in this draft. 
and not going to lie, at one point he was OT5. And it was very tough for me to actually drop him down to where he was. But OT5 for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, OT6. Sorry. <laughs> where were we? I totally just got off of what I was talking about. Thank you for the brain fart there. OT6, excuse me, is what we're on. Um, if I can find out where I'm at here. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Wow, this is talking about going through a spreadsheet and dead time on We're the live, air. folks. We're live. There it is. I got it. Sorry <laughs> about that. Okay. Tulsa's Tyler Smith. Smith is another player. To me, here's here's my best way to describe him. Any any team that is targeting Trevor Penning that either misses out on him or chooses to pass on him, if they want a good consolation prize when you're talking about someone who just plays nasty, but with out all the penalty aspects, Tyler Smith is your guy. And he brings that nasty demeanor to the field um, and arguably has arguably has the most upside of anybody in this offensive tackle class. I hmm. absolutely love what I see from Tyler Smith. And Dan, even at 21 years old, he just turned 21 years old this month. He's extremely young coming into the NFL. And he already has so many pass blocking snaps under his belt. It's just, it's insane for what he's been able to do in his college career in such a short period of time. Some people project him inside as, as, as a guard because he doesn't have the longest arms, but it's still good size at 6'6, 320. Again, we talked about the, uh, the nasty streak. He's got violent hands coupled with good footwork. And Dan, we were just talking a few minutes ago about Iki Iquamu's big time blocks. Icky, Icky had 18 this year. Only one player surpassed him in big time blocks this year, and it was Tyler Smith with 21. 21 big time blocks allowed, and only seven pressures in 2021. Not too bad. And again, for a kid that just turned 21 years 21 years old this uh, this month, again, he's not the most seasoned. Some people would like to see a hell of a lot more experience. If Tyler Smith was, you know. Uh, was it was a starter in 2019 instead of 2020? I'm sure he would have been a lot higher on people's boards right now. Um, but there was buzz a couple of weeks about him, Dan, possibly being a late first round pick. Now I don't see that. Possibly other teams do. Um, and he's not the most polished prospect. Again, very very young. And some people believe, like I said, that he's better suited at guard at the next level. But I personally think if you pair him with some solid coaching, with his measurables. And that violent streak that you would like to see. And again, for a guy who's so young and has already put together a lot of good snaps under his belt, especially when it's come to pass blocking, he could develop into a very, very nice offensive tackle moving forward. So uh, I really like Tyler Smith. I have him just outside of my tackle list top 10. I have him as my number 11. Only because as a tackle... <laughs> As Dan Wolgan's side hits me with a double whammy. First, he has to have Daniel Falele as his offensive tackle five, and now he tells me that he has he doesn't even rank Tyler Smith in his top ten. Wow, it's going to be a good rest of the show. <laughs> now, Tyler Smith is a midday two pick for me. So he is a great offensive lineman, but I don't see him as being a great offensive tackle. Like I think he'd be a very versatile offensive line. But if I'm talking pure right tackle, I have him as a number 11. Um, that said, super stocky lower half, kind of has like a super long torso that like kind of puts him at a dis disadvantage sometimes where he looks like he's playing higher than you would like. Uh, you mentioned it, super physical. Um, has that mean streak too, where you're like, dude, like don't want to get stuck with him. Um Man, like he can finish a play. I don't want to repeat all the stuff that you had mentioned. I like Tyler Smith, but I think his skill set is more tailored to being a very, very, very good guard. But as a tackle, like I said, just out of my top 10. Uh, my nine, number six, Jake, was Bernard Raymond. So now we are on to number seven. And I think this is one that is gaining a little bit of traction here, Jake. Kid out of Washington State, Abraham Lucas, I have as my... Offensive tackle number seven. Is that where, is that where you at? You we're, got him? We're back on the road. Woo, let's go. Circle the wagons. All right. Abraham Lucas. After a hard uh, rate turn, Dan <laughs> is back in the fast lane. 
I love this kid, man. I think he has a great lower half, thick lower half, um, really good motor, really good base. I love his anchor. Uh, I, I think he has a really athletic build for his size. Solid run blocking, plays through the whistle, definitely has that kind of nasty streak that I'd love to have on this offensive line. Um, he has kind of a calm technique to him. I don't know about you, but he always kind of seems like he's in control. Uh, and he is very quick with getting to the second level, especially at with either the screen passes or with running the run game. Uh, I really like him. I, I think he's got a late ta- late day two grade for me. Love his leverage. Uh, I don't think enough people are talking about this guy. Well, I think he's starting to get some notoriety. Uh, notoriety now, Dan, it was reported today that he has actually had 12, 12 private visits with NFL teams. So Damn people it. are definitely starting <laughs> to take notice. So if that burst your bubble, um, sorry to tell you that. But let's just say hypothetically, if the Chargers were to trade back, acquire some extra draft capital that they lost in the Khalil Mack trade. If you decided to fill the gap at the right tackle position with your second round pick, I would love, absolutely love if it was Abraham Lucas. Dan, we went from, we go from one side of the spectrum from my OT six to my OT seven. We talked about the, you know, not necessarily the longest tenured experience from Tyler Smith to now one of the most seasoned offensive tackles here in Abraham Lucas. Four-year starter, 43 starts over those four years. And Dan, we were talking about pass protection. Lucas has recorded over 2,000 pass blocking snaps during his college career. On top of that, people, he's durable. So when it comes to an offensive lineman, especially for the Chargers, you like to see that. Uh, He's got the athletic traits that you want from a tackle his size. Has a high school basketball background, so that's you know definitely translatable athletic skills there. So he's not a stranger to moving his feet. Has that mirror ability that you want to see from defenders. He's patient, doesn't overextend his hands. Put up some very nice reps during Senior Bowl week. I thought he had a great week when you look, really look at the offensive and defensive line drills that he was doing. Um, not the fastest when it comes to getting to the to the second level and the run blocking. It's still not bad. But if you're talking about getting downhill, he's not the fastest when it comes to that. And he's still going to need some refining to his uh, his pass and his run blocking technique. But for a player with this much experience and athletic ability, I think he can develop into a nice anchor on the right side. See, I thought the only thing I think we disagree there is his ability to get to the second level. I thought he looked pretty good going at a second level. I mean, I mean, I think he could do it. I mean, it's not it's not terrible, but it's not it's you see guys that do it quicker than him. You'd like to see him get out there just a little bit faster to me. That's all. Sure. Okay. Number eight, Jake. We're, we'll go rapid speed here with these last guys. Uh, I'm gonna let you take this one, although I believe that you might have him lower than me. You were the one that actually got me introduced to this man, a one Max Mitchell. I have him as OT eight on my list. Where do you have him? He is my OT nine. So please, by all take means, the take the reins. Take the reins on. Take the reins. No, because no, my OT eight is different than yours. And you brought up Max Mitchell, and I'm a huge Max Mitchell fan, probably more so than a lot of people. But by all means. Good. All right, so Ma- so Max Mitchell, I think honestly, is not getting talked about enough, and I don't understand why. Like, I believe I think NFL had NFL. I think Lance Irvine had him graded higher than Abraham Lucas. Um, he is a little bit slower in terms of like the forty yard dash, but like who? What offensive lines running forty yard dashes these days? Um, he has just a he has a very clean feel to him in terms of his play style. Um, I you don't necessarily ever really see him like getting out of position too much. Uh, seems very controlled with his technique. Uh, I think he was the captain of his team. Um, I I really I like Max Mitchell. Like I, I I think he is a little bit on the on the lighter side, like six six under three hundred pounds. So you'd like to see that get a little bit bigger, and that's kind of a risk. Um, but look, three cone drill, eight seconds. 4.6 20-yard shuttle, like, you'll take that. The the, the thing that I think kind of concerns me is um, I don't necessarily know how good he is against, like, multi-moves and, like, the elite pass rushers. Um, I, I I feel like he can get beat 
by folks who impose their will more on the edge. Um, but I like him. Like he just seems like a, like he seems just like a solid offensive tackle prospect. Again, project. I don't necessarily know if I'd want him to be my starter, but I like him. I didn't realize that you said that Lance Zerline had him rated above Abraham Lucas. Uh, I don't know if it's Lance Zerline, but I think on NFL, I thought NFL has his prospect grade as a bit higher than Abraham Lucas. Interesting. Okay. Um, I have not seen that. Uh, for me, I've always been six, a fan. Real quick. Of, six, six point two for Max Mitchell and Abraham Lucas was 6.15. So they're close. Okay. Interesting. I think just as a better, as a better overall prospect, as far as taking that next jump and developing faster to the NFL level, I would have Max Mitchell behind Abraham Lucas. So this list says obviously, but I've been a Max Mitchell fan and Dan will say this for probably going all the way back since January. I've been waiting to talk about Max Mitchell for this long. And I just love the natural traits about him statistically, I think that kind of flies under the radar, Dan, as you had mentioned, is that if you go back and you really dig into what he did in 2021, he was one of the best run blocking right tackles in the country and was not bad when it came to pass blocking either only gave him 13 pressures over 430 pass blocking attempts. And he's just kind of one of these guys that's flown under the radar. And part of that, yes, is because he didn't test that well outside of what he ran in the 40, his three cone drill wasn't, uh, wasn't ideal for what you want to see. So that doesn't tell you as far as the lateral movement is going to translate that well at the next level. Also, he's not coming from a college that played, you know, top end elite talent, but still came from a good coaching staff down there in Louisiana that, you know, does pretty well with offensive linemen. They know what they want their, uh, their guys to do. But Max Mitchell, as you said, Dan, he was a leader for that team. Uh, plays with a lot of consistency and toughness. There's not too many ebbs and flows to his game, which is great. He's got the fundamentals and the technical prowess with his handwork, good mirroring ability to match pass rushers. Doesn't have all the physical intangibles that you need in a tackle. And obviously, as I mentioned, didn't have the best testing at the combine, but he's got a high football IQ at this position, just knows how to win with technique. And I think he's only going to get better with coaching. So yes, He's gonna have to. He's gonna he's gonna have to use technique as his crutch because he's not gonna overpower guys that much at the NFL level. He's not gonna be able to to beat him with his athletic ability. So he's just gonna have to go back to his fundamentals and te- his techniques and the things that brought him to the dance in the first place. He's only gonna need to elevate those even further. But I love Max Mitchell. I would I would not be sorry at all to have him be a right tackle for this team. No, and, and again, as we close this out, we're, we're going through, we're, we're at our offensive tackles, what, nine and 10 now? And like the goal, if you think about this, where I think for Max Mitchell, I have him as a day two guy, uh, late day two. Petit Ferrer is my number nine, which I don't know where he's on your list. Um, at this point, you're hoping to get an offensive tackle at 79 is where we're currently slated. Like the hope at that point would be that the guy could be Average, above average at best in the NFL. If you can get an above average offensive tackle at 79, like you hit pretty good. So in context, like we're, let's pump that. Like we're, we're excited about these guys. We like these guys, but also put them in their proper place in terms of like where we see their floor and ceiling. So I don't want people to get all up in arms. Like, oh, they love them, but he's I'm like, come on guys. They will, Dan. They will. <laughs> That's why I just put it out there. I just put it out there. Um, Petit Ferrer at Ohio State, I have his number nine. Um, I'll just go quickly with him. Huge run game advantage, I believe, with him. I think that's kind of his calling card. Uh, quick, athletic, lower half. But honestly, like, again, we're talking about day two, and this almost feels like a flyer. Like, I think he's got good experience. I would, I, I, even, I don't know. I might even be a little disappointed if they picked him at 79. If I'm being honest, <laughs> as I'm talking talk, about it, as I'm talk talking about it, I'm like, out yes. of your, if you're number 10 guy without even giving him 30 seconds. Oh, number nine. Man. Number, yeah. number nine. Number nine. But I think okay. I, should, I should probably have his number 10. 
Yeah, talking like that. Yeah, maybe you want to just redo flip flop your last two people there. Uh, let me jump back to my OT eight as I uh, as we kind of jumped a little bit ahead. My OT nine, just for a reminder, was Max Mitchell, and then Dan decided to you know um, piss me off faster than expected by talking about Daniel Falele, who I had as my offensive tackle tens. But my offensive tackle eight, Kellen Beach out of Arizona State. This is another Shout guy out. who fills these athletic traits that you'd want to see six, seven, a bit undersized from someone who's coming in at this height, only 300 pounds, but still ran a four, eight, nine in the 40. Dan had a, it was a one, seven, 10 yard split and get this a four, four, three in the short shuttle. He had a very nice jump in production between 2020 and 2021. Um, last season, he only allowed two sacks and six quarterback hurries. That was over 421 pass blocking reps. And like I mentioned, he came in a little bit leaner than what you would expect from a tackle. So he's definitely going to need to get a handle of that when he hits the NFL. But still, light on his feet, gets to the second level quickly, has that lateral movement that you want to see, uh, can handle speed rushers because of that quickness. And while he's shown good reps as a pass blocker, he's still there's still a lot of room for improvement for him. And because he doesn't have the natural strength and power as some of these other tackles, he needs to be polished and technical at the le- at the next level. So he's a lot like Max Mitchell in that regard, where he's going to need to really rely on his technique to get himself a win as he puts, um, you know, puts his puts the the weight on and and gets in the strength and conditioning room. Obviously, sure. No, I, I agree. Um, I, I like him. Obviously. Um, so number ten Talk might be a be in- <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm just going to let leave it there. Uh, okay. So number nine talked about Nicholas Petit for you already have your number 10. My number 10 is my, this might be a cheat. I don't know. I put Darren Kennard in as my offensive tackle 10. I know people have him as a guard, the next level, but on like kind of sheer talent alone, Some I don't have him as a tackle. Right. Yeah. So I, I think he could be either one. Um, and as a tackle, I have him as my tackle 10. Uh, super physical, brings a presence to the offensive line. You see him driving edge defenders to the ground all the time. Uh, smothers speed rushers with ease. Clears running lanes, finishes blocking. Kind of has that like bull in a china shot mentality. Um, again, he could be a guard, but like I've got a feeling like he's going to be like a mid-day two pick just because of kind of like the possible versatility that he brings. So real quick, that wraps up our top 10. Jake, before we kind of switch gears here, uh, let's, let's go through real quick, just a couple sentences on some of these guys. Who are some of your like honorable mentions that, again, we're, we're past day one, day two, we're past day one and day two, maybe late day two, but day three flyers who you think might be warranting some closer eyes as a flyer? Man, um, First of all, I'm glad you brought up Darian Kennard because as we prefaced before our list started going off, um, depending on how it is that you look at him and how depending on how the coaches are looking at him, some of these guys could be tackled. Some of them could be guards to next level. I personally thought Darian Kennard was going to be is going to translate best to a guard at the next level. But honestly, if he was a tackle, I probably would have him in my around that seven, eight range because I love what I saw from Darian Kennard at Kentucky. Uh, absolutely loved it. Um, Nicholas Petit Ferrer was just outside my top 10 here. Uh, same, uh, from, um, uh, Sean Ryan, another guy from UCLA. A lot of people like him and I could see why, but I just see him more as a guard at the next, at the next level. Uh, Dan, how about Braxton Jones out of Southern Utah? Give a little Mm. small school love there. Like what I see from him on tape, another one of these athletic tackles that I hope is going to be able to translate well to the next level. So yeah, those are some of my guys, uh, that I had just outside of it. Still, this ended up being a little bit more of a difficult list when you got outside the top three on how you started ranking these guys. Totally. Totally. Um, all right. I won't double up on some of the guys you talked about. So I'll try to go, uh, some other guys, uh, Jamari Sal- Salier, I believe, uh, dude, university of Georgia, versatile lineman played tackle guard and center. I feel like teams are going to love him. Uh, six, three, three, 20 quick feet, compact, Big frame, but he doesn't have the longest arms, which I think might hurt him, which I think is why people probably see him as possibly going inside. 
Um, but again, I think he's good both versus the run and the pass. Uh, Jamari Salier, I like a lot. A um, couple other guys. Myron Cunningham out of Arkansas. Love him. The guy's huge, uh, long arms, thick, lengthy frame. I mean, if you talk about a team that averaged over, I want to say like 240 yards a game. This guy allowed on running plays. This guy allowed only three sacks in over 380 passing plays and committed just four penalties in almost 900 snaps. Um, again, developmental, day three guy, but averaged 227 yards per game to lead all power five schools in the run game. Uh, can get beat outside, but I like Myron Cunningham. Uh, a couple other ones, real quick. Dan Rosenthal out of LSU slash Kentucky went to both schools. Uh, like him a lot. You tell he has that nastiness. And then you already talked about Tyler Smith, who I liked as well, but had him just outside my top 10. <laughs> so that'll sorry, put a bow. <laughs> yeah. We don't, we don't need to go into it more and reopen that wound that you violently just plunged into my heart <laughs> about 30 minutes ago. Uh, but that'll put a bow on our <laughs> prospect rankings of our offensive tackles. Uh, and again, being this close to the draft, who knows what the hell is going to happen. So two things I want to get in here before we close out this show today, Dan, because I think that they're pertinent here in this situation. So number one, given where the Chargers have their draft selections right now, obviously they don't have a second round pick with them trading that away for Khalil Mack. And so if they are going to indeed be filling this gap at the right tackle position, do you think it's first round or bust because of the lack of draft capital? Or do you think that they would be realistically say to themselves, you know what, we got to fill this gap regardless. So even if we don't go offensive tackle in the first round, let's pull the trigger in the third. Do I think it's going to be offensive tackle or bust? I think if Remember, it's I'm not offense... offensive tackle, I'm not saying offensive line. I'm saying right. offensive right yeah. tackle. Offensive tackle. If they choose to address the offensive tackle, is it first they, round or bust? Yes. If they, in my eyes, yes, because I don't think any offensive tackle you're getting in round three is going to be better than Matt Filer. Period. Good and a good trans uh, transition there, and I think the same thing. If it's uh, if it's not Charles Cross, because we already know that we're not getting Nikki Aquamu or Evan Neal, Charles Cross would be the last prospect as far as offensive tackles go in the first round. I would then transition I, to. A I could position. be swayed depending, but we've already discussed that. But good on you for bringing up Matt Filer because I want to talk about two aspects here that Daniel Popper has actually brought up this week. If you guys listen to the NFL Stock Exchange, first off, you should because it's a great show. But they actually brought on Daniel Popper this week as part of their guest host on their mock draft series. And the way that the mock draft fell to the point when they brought on Popper to pick for the Chargers at 17, four tackles had already gone off the board. Kwame was gone, Neal was gone, Cross was gone, and Penning was gone. So Popper did say before he ultimately ended up making his selection that he definitely thought that he could see the Chargers going for any one of those four players at 17. I know that doesn't make a lot of us feel good right now, especially who we, <laughs> who we know was the number four tackle in that sort of situation. But the other aspect of this is talking about the offensive line. Daniel Popper also took a question from his, Charles mail, uh, from his Chargers mailbag. And it was a question in regards to Ode Bushi. What are they going to do at right tackle? So what he did happen to say was, is that good news for the Chargers, at least at this point, is that Ode firmly remains in their plans in order to hopefully bring him back and is a high priority for them to hopefully bring them back. He said he doesn't foresee a signing of him before the draft ends up happening. So until everything kind of ends up rounding itself out, he could see them bringing Ode after the draft. And this could also be after the Chargers address not offensive tackle, but offensive guard and doing a double whammy. So let's just say for an example, if we're talking 17 and a Zion Johnson at number 17, on top of signing Ode Abusha. And then, and like Dan said, the plan that has been documented well by Daniel Popper 
is that you could move him from left guard to right tackle because he has experience there. And as Dan just mentioned, none of the guys that you'd be taking in the third round would excel the play of Matt Filer at this point. So, Dan, just put your thinking cap on there in a second. And, of course, we'll dive into this when we get into our interior offensive line. But there are not... They're not the Chargers again are not so pigeonholed into one They're or not. two positions here. They have a plan here. And can you imagine if you plugged a guy like Zion Johnson in the middle of a Sean Slater and a Corey Lindsley? Oh my God. <laughs> imagine that line though. Like, like let's just say it's Matt Filer. Like Matt Filer, Zion Johnson, Corey Lindsley. Let's say it's Ode Bushi. And Rashawn Slater. Like, hell yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> I know everybody wants continuity along the offensive line, and hey, I'm all for that too, especially with as good as Filer played at left guard last year. But still, as a consolation prize, if the draft falls that way and addressing the offensive line in general was your number one priority, and that's the way it falls with four tackles going off before you, uh, before you end up selecting, yeah, why the hell not? One of the yep. best guards in this entire draft and where you choose to plug him in and who you choose to plug him in in between. Oh man, I would be all for that. hundred percent. So again, chargers have lots of options and lots of ways to go about fixing quote unquote, the offensive line quote unquote woes that they have going for them right now. And it's not just by getting offensive tackle that can go guard and then offensive tackle in free agency and or draft and can achieve success at the offensive line and still have an opportunity to be much better offensive line in totality than they were in 2021, which for the chargers 2021 was a damn good year. I know we all have a small sour taste in our mouth from Max Crosby in week 18, but like otherwise like our offensive line is pretty good. So if we can get better than last year, we'll take it. Jake, we just went through, Probably what, 15 to 20 guys in total for offensive tackle, asterisk, possibly a couple guards. Um, anything else you want to tell the good people before we sign off today? Uh, you know what? I'm actually glad that we got this one behind us because, like I said, it turned out to be a little bit more difficult than I thought. Uh, you <laughs> kind of disappointed me it's gonna take a little bit to wash that taste out of my mouth for the slander that you gave tyler smith and, i like uh, him i like him just the disrespect you gave tyler smith and the anger that you caused me by <laughs> daniel filele that combination dude it was a one-two punch i'm sorry i couldn't take it Bye. i may have to hold that one against you for the next two weeks but dan as i said on twitter today the these two weeks before the draft we've got two more two more thursdays before the draft and i swear to god the days feel like they're moving like a sloth caught in molasses it's just way too slow so somebody needs to put me in a damn delorean and speed this shit the fuck up let's go all right jake we did it we got through offensive tackle uh and possible options for the chargers at offensive line as they proceed between now and uh otas all right, guys, again, if you do not know where to find Jake and his magnificent backwards hat mantra, go to at Jake T. Hefner on Twitter. You find I mean, myself at Char He also has a great beard. At Chargers Homer for myself, underscore, or excuse me, Chargers. What's our Twitter handle, Jake? <laughs> it's on our damn top of the show. Wow. At LAC underscore, underscore <laughs> Unleashed. Dan. That was been a minute. Okay. Clearly, we've kept you too long. I know Woo! dinner's waiting for you. I have like a total. Like, Maybe great go part. put a nice beer, seltzer, whiskey, whatever it choose, you choose to drink. But maybe you have one of those with your meal this evening. I will. Okay, for folks who have not already done so, please like, subscribe, hit that follow button anywhere you find us, whether it's on podcasts, on Apple, on Spotify, or wherever else. Uh, be sure to check out our YouTube. And we will talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed.